Good afternoon, disaster and emergency management leaders. Welcome to Hazardscape Live this Wednesday, September the 16th. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, today we have Drone Delivery Canada with CEO Michael Zara. And Michael is responsible for developing and executing the strategic plan to commercialize uh, the business. And he's a seasoned executive with over 30 years experience as a senior level leader. Uh, he brings an in-depth experience in engineering, logistics, management, customer vendor relationship management, and strategic planning to the company. And uh, we're going to be talking today about drone delivery and its application to emergency management. We've got some uh, photos and, and video we'll show. So I would like to introduce uh, Michael to the show. Good afternoon, Michael. Good afternoon. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. And if you're listening, just tuning in, make sure to leave a comment or question. We'll, we'll try to get to it. And just let us know where you're calling in from because we like to track that. So, Michael, can you tell us uh, a little bit right off the bat about Drone Delivery Canada and how it first came about? Because I, I mean, for myself, I first heard about drone delivery when Amazon made a big announcement and that that was not very long ago. And I think that caught the attention of a lot of people. But I think Drone Delivery Canada has been in the works far longer than that. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, um, the company started about uh, six years ago, and obviously the first few years were developing the technology and working with the regulatory body in Canada, who's Transport Canada, and uh, really developing that and getting regulatory approval. So, uh, and the, the original the original focus was uh, really remote communities, indigenous communities non-indigenous communities of which there are many in Canada and then obviously around the world as well. And then we've got into, you know, commercial industrial markets and expanded our fleet and, um, and so on. But uh, yeah, about six years ago, the company started. Yeah. Okay. And so you had just recently, and another thing that caught my attention with drone delivery Canada was the uh, Georgina Island first nations. You successfully delivered some supplies to them. So we have two projects that are quite similar that are both um, COVID-19 specific. One is uh, Beausoleil First Nation, and the other is Georgina Island uh, First Nation. They're both in Northern Ontario. They're similar in that they're both uh, pandemic related. They're both uh, communities of a, a mainland and an island component. And uh, really the, the spirit of the, the projects is to limit person to person contact while maintaining the supply chain. So obviously drones are ideal for that. They want to limit uh, ferry usage and, and uh, uh, non-community people coming onto the island, et cetera. So they both uh, engage with us the, for the Sparrow drone uh, for logistics okay. applications. Yeah. Okay. And I think I've got, uh, you can guide me through some of these. I'm going to do my best guess to see okay. which which is the Sparrow. Um, I that's don't think sparrow. Yeah. that's the Sparrow. Okay. I got it. So yeah. that's the Sparrow <laughs> drone and that's what you were using for the First Nation? So yeah, it's the, the that's okay. the Sparrow drone. This one in particular is for a project we did um, recently. It's actually an ongoing project uh, with Peel Region, and uh, you can see on the drone it says AED drone. Yeah, and it's actually a medical drone. So we've got a defibrillator in there, and we're uh, we're delivering a defibrillator to a, uh, a simulated cardiac arrest person in a rural community, and we can obviously get there faster than an ambulance. So, but it's yeah. the same. It's the same drone, just different application. Okay, and I, I noticed you guys like you put you can put different branding of the companies you deliver to on your drones. I yeah, guess. whoever the whoever the yeah. primary customer is for the project, absolutely, we put their logo on on the system. Yeah, sure. Okay, I thought that was cool. Uh, and then this is the uh, condor. That's right. In between the condor, there's a there's a robin, but this there's is a robin. Condor. Yeah. So this is our largest drone today. That's this. Uh, yeah, sorry. That's, oh, that's sorry. Condor. I'll bring back the condor. No problem. So that's the condor. Uh, that's our largest today. Um, it's a gasoline uh, powered drone. You can see the engine kind of in the back there. Yeah. And obviously, it looks like a, a helicopter. It's a smallish helicopter. Um, yeah. And that's um, more bulk, long range, 
capability, 200 kilometer range, 180 kilograms or 400 pounds of payload. 400 pounds. Yep. Wow. So when, so a question I had when you're delivering to remote areas, like do you have fueling stations along the way? So typically, I mean, the network depends on, on the customer. So typically we're flying uh, from point to point. Okay. Um, and it could be from A to B and back to A and back and forth all day long, if that's what the network looks like. Just okay. It's like, for instance, Georgina Island and Beausoleil, we're flying from mainland to island back and forth, and that's really the route. Um, it could be a customer that's got one point of origin, multiple points of destination, or it could be a milk run where we're going from uh, from point to point to point around a big circle, for instance. <clears throat> so you know, it does need to be refueled every 200 kilometers. So right. on the network, that could be at the end of the run or halfway through. It really uh, depends on on the um, on the network and its configuration. So how how do you like? Is it the community that's delivering to? Will they fill it up, or do you have dedicated stations along the way, like a helicopter would? So for Georgina Island and both Slay, they're both using the Sparrow, which is electric. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So it, it makes no difference whether you're changing a battery or changing or adding gasoline. It's still you know some okay. kind of interaction to uh, uh, to do what you need to do. So in the case of the of the Sparrow for Georgina Island or both Slay. We'd be doing flights, and there's a automated software system. But this is all of these components that I'm talking about are part of our intellectual property and and, uh, and our patents. <clears throat> so, flight, uh, F L Y T E, is an automated uh, software system that really wraps it all together. And flight is monitoring uh, the battery remaining capacity and knows what the next route is. Uh, if the battery's capacity to do that route, the drone will take off. It's, if it's not, Flight will alert uh, one of the operators that they go to the battery management system, which is part of our uh, equipment as well, and swap out the battery. So it's it's fairly easy to do, um, but the system really advises them to swap out the batteries or change the fuel or whatever required. Okay. And so are you, uh, like, do you, for, for the people that do that, that would not be, because I assume Drone Delivery Canada doesn't have people out in the communities where they're landing and may need a battery swap. Do you provide training to those communities to do that kind of thing? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So we would set up the system originally um, from the start and uh, you know run it alongside the customer as an example, maybe for a month or so to get them some hands-on training. We have a full uh, um, Drone Delivery Canada University, it's called, oh, with okay. online training for our customers and then hands-on training. So we provide that as, uh, as part of the whole program. So then they would be the operator, meaning they would be the one who's loading and unloading the cargo, changing the batteries and that sort of thing. That is really cool that you do that. Yeah. Um, I did not know that. That's uh, that's awesome. Um, and I think I've got, uh, this is your op center. That's right. So the system runs unmanned automatically. So there's nobody that's manually flying it or you know flying it by camera or anything like that. Uh, it runs unmanned automatically, uh, globally, anywhere in the world, 24-7, 365. And this operations control center where you've got the, the photo shown, and the photo really doesn't do it justice. The room is very uh, NASA-like and, uh, and yeah. quite un unprecedented globally for drones. We're monitoring our drones globally from this room. And if there's an issue in the airspace, just say another aircraft is having an emergency and everybody needs to clear the way or something along those lines, we can manually take control of our drone okay. anywhere in the world and do whatever we need to do to deconflict the situation. So again, the flight software is monitoring other air traffic and what's going on and alerts us if there's any kind of issue, and then we can uh, deconflict the situation as necessary. So otherwise uh, it runs unmanned automatically. Oh, okay. So great. And so if you're just tuning in with us live, we're with uh, CEO Michael Zara. I'm pronouncing that right. I didn't check, but it's, is it Zara? Zara. That's fine. Zara, Zara. Michael Zara, CEO of Drone Delivery Canada. And we're just talking about uh, just the initial uh, setup and, and getting some base information on, on the company and what it does. So the, the reason, you know, a main reason I brought you on was uh, just to talk about some of the applications with drone delivery and emergency management. 
uh, in Canada, emergency or local authorities are responsible for their own emergency management agency and their emergency management plans. Right. And I think that Drone Delivery Canada uh, would be an awesome uh, resource to add to any remote isolated community's emergency management plan as an alternative to bringing in goods uh, outside of helicopters or, or traditional aircraft. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our, our intent is not to replace traditional, uh, you know, 18 wheeler trucks or, or, you know, sort of traditional logistics platforms, but really to, to augment them or to extend them in a variety of use cases. And the use cases are typically, um, remote communities, whether indigenous or not. And that, that's typically last mile and last mile ends up being you know, very inefficient or very inexpensive or not always available or very dangerous or whatever the situation happens to be for whoever the courier company is or whoever the company uh, is yeah. doing it for themselves. Um, so really remote access is, is, is one application. The other application is really where time is critical. So maybe you can get there, uh, but if I can get there faster with a drone, that makes all the difference. And it could be that, you know, time is money or it could be, uh, you know, in, in your world or in, in healthcare, uh, time could be lives. So if there's a natural disaster, if there's an emergency, if there's some kind of uh, situation going on, medical or what have you, where I can get there more quickly with a drone, then that could make all the difference. So that's another application. Then with the pandemic, uh, there's two more use cases. And um, one we mentioned uh, briefly, and that's limiting person to person contact while still maintaining the supply chain. A lot of facilities, they don't want to cross contaminate or a lot of communities don't want to have outside uh, visitors coming in and bringing the virus, but they need to keep the supply chain open. So drones are perfect for that. And then the last one, which also might be relevant to your folks, is um, when something happens like this or a natural disaster, people dust off their uh, disaster recovery and business continuity binders and they realize that they either don't have a good plan or they don't have a backup to their plan and they probably don't have a backup to the supply chain. So drones could be a good backup to the supply chain uh, in cases like uh, like a pandemic or natural disaster. So really those four use cases are, are what we're all about. Yeah, absolutely. So what what kind of time frame are we talking about? So let, let's say a community has gone to the length of, and I, I don't know if there's a in particular, but you know, somewhere up in the Northwest Territories, and they've, they've gone through the process already of being prepared and contacting you and they've gone through the training and they're they're ready to receive goods if they if they made a phone call how long until you guys get the drone in the air from where it would launch usually? so the the way the projects typically work <clears throat> is they're not launched from us they're at the customer's location so Oh, okay. um, example of Georgina Island or, or Beausoleil, those two projects that we've talked about, the the drone is kept at the community. So the infrastructure would consist of what we call a drone spot, which is basically a, an automated depot that's got access control and security cameras and barcode scanners and a weather station and these sort of things. There'd be one on the yeah. mainland, there'd be one on the island, which is about four kilometers uh, away and roughly in, in both cases of these uh, similar projects and the drone would remain at one of those depots and oh, then okay started, you load the cargo um the system knows where it's going it's all set up released and then it flies over the water and then it lands at the other depot so it's basically flying back and forth between these drone spots so there'd be two drones oh. there'd be one drone that stays there and then there'd be some kind of a, a battery management system either on the island or on the mainland where they would recharge and, and occasionally change batteries. So that's what the infrastructure looks like. And it would be at the customer. The drone doesn't take off from us, for instance. Oh, okay. That's incredible. Yeah. So every every time you bring on a new customer, you're you're buying new drone. I don't think you you don't make the you don't develop them yourself. You you yeah, purchase a drone. Right. Yeah. No, we and do, and we do we do make them ourselves. You do make them yourself. Okay. Yeah, so we're you not, we're not buying a well, we're buying third party components like you know batteries yeah. and carbon fiber and motors and stuff like that but the drone sure. itself uh, the end the end resulting drone is made by us okay and so customer gets a drone on their location and every that is absolutely amazing yeah so we set up the infrastructure at the customer 
And again, it depends what the customer wants. It could be like the Georgian Island Beausoleil projects where it's just a point of or one point of origin, one point of destination, and we can deliver cargo in both directions. It could be one point of origin and multiple points of destination. It could be any kind of network that the customer wants. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that makes it even uh, a lot more accessible for those communities to have it on location. Absolutely. So it's a, it's available immediately. Like in the like in the defibrillator case that we did in Peel Region, I mean the the drone takes off from an EMS uh, location where there's police or ambulance or fire department or whatever they happen to choose, and we take off from there with the defibrillator. So it's a very quick response. Now, if the destination does not have uh, any infrastructure, like a drone spot at the destination, which may be in the case of medical emergencies or what have you, we have the ability to lower altitude and then drop the cargo and then fly back. So there could be zero infrastructure okay. at the destination, not our preferred model, but in the case of emergencies or hazards or humanitarian aid or natural disasters, it's not always going to be infrastructure at the point of destination. So we can drop right. the cargo. Yeah. Do you, um, how does it work then when there's a notice to airmen, do you get special uh, like you're able to fly within those constraints or you've got to apply for special access? So we don't need to file a flight plan when we fly. We just, okay. we, we, so we're a compliant operator. So we're certified by Transport Canada to fly anywhere in Canada, as long as we follow the basic rules for commercial drone operations. So as long as we're following those rules, we don't need to file a, a flight plan for a project or for, uh, for every flight. So we uh, we are aware through our uh, flight management system where other aircraft are, whether they have ADSB or not, and then we can manage in active airspace so that we integrate safely and, uh, and there's no issues. But we're not we're not issuing a a no tam or something like that every okay. time we fly. So right, that okay. Um, so I've got a I've got a, a quick a, a video here, and maybe you can walk through as it plays uh, what we're seeing. Sure. So this is one of our older drone spots. The newer one is a lot more sophisticated, different panel. So it's got access control. He just scanned a barcode. He's typing in a, a pin, security pin to give him access. Uh, he's going in this, uh, this drone spot. He's loading the cargo and you can see the four batteries above it. He's loading the cargo, he's closing it up. Um, and then he's going to uh, enter another code, say everything's okay. Um, and then he's gonna leave the drone spot um confirm everything is okay and then we would do a few basic checks on weather and airspace and security camera and then it would take off this actual flight right here is in new york uh actually at an airport uh in new york so uh that's where that video comes from okay and, and that's the sparrow fly this is our mobile command center which we would use when we're first setting up a project before we release it to the customer just to get everything up and running uh, this is our older operations center. Uh, center. Uh, the the photo you showed was of our of our new operations uh, control center. Okay. Okay. And this is again. This is the sparrow. All of these are the sparrow flying. The one that uh, that we've been talking about. Okay. And this is another um, the drone spot. It's basically just a caged area. How how do you manage security at the the drone spots? So um, the drone spot itself can have a variety of different configurations. It can have a closed roof, uh, it can have an open roof, but there's always security cameras, there's access control panel on the inside and the outside. Uh, there's a door that is locked and it's only released when you type in a certain code or, or what have you. So it is a very secure environment. Uh, this is us flying, I believe with the Moussini project. You can see we can fly day, night, we can fly in the snow, we can fly in the rain. Uh, this is flying uh, at Moussini in the snow. Yeah, that is absolutely incredible. And this is the the Condor, uh, our largest drone, which is the gasoline one that we talked about a little while ago. You can see it looks like a small helicopter. Yeah, that is... Uh, I, I was not expecting to hear that you have drone spots all over the place where drones are sitting waiting to be either the, the spots are waiting to receive a drone or one is just sitting there waiting to receive cargo. Yeah, they would be specific to the 
to the customer. We're not sprinkling them across no. the country, but we yeah. would implement that infrastructure. Yeah, you're right. We would be implementing that infrastructure at the customer project. So if it was that a awesome. if it was a retailer or if it was medical or industrial or a mine or oil and gas or whatever it is, we would set up that infrastructure at the customer. Okay. So if you're just tuning in, uh, drop a, a question or comment in the comments, hit the like button. Uh, we, we can ask uh, Michael Michael anything around Drone Delivery Canada. I, I'm curious to know your the furthest flight that you've done either on, on one tank of gas or, or one set of batteries and just the furthest one in general. Uh, that's an interesting question. I've never been asked that. And off the top of my head, I'm actually not sure. Um, we do have a test range about um, 20 minutes north of our office. It's 100 acres where we do testing. And we have flown in you know, different patterns to, uh, to accumulate X number of uh, kilometers, simulating a uh, you know, certain number of kilometers. Um, I'm not sure how many kilometers the longest uh, we've flown. I'm going to guess maybe around 10 or so but I, i'd really be guessing okay and do you like do you see one day and i'm because you're not just in canada correct we started right. the process of entering the us and we're working on uh potential partners and projects in uh, in other countries but today we're operating primarily in canada uh but entering the us shortly okay because i i also see this is a great application for uh adventurers and hikers that go into the backcountry, like having because right now you know you do the continental divide hike it's it, it takes months and people get food dropped off at the the post station so they can resupply like potentially a, a major expedition could use you to do some supply drops uh, absolutely and in addition yeah. to just sort of supply drops of food and water and those sort of things you can imagine if somebody's in one of the large national parks in Canada or the US or anywhere in the world, you might be canoeing and maybe you're allergic to bees and you get stung and you don't have your EpiPen. We could deliver an EpiPen. We could deliver an insulin syringe. If somebody's having a, a diabetic event and they don't have their insulin, we could be delivering a defibrillator, a snake bite kit to somewhere in rural Africa where a tourist is maybe there for photography. So, you know, any of those sort of things, um, you know, can be delivered related to, you know, what you're talking about is, you know, humanitarian or emergency aid. Yeah. And, and so like where, where is drone technology going next? Because I can't, like, I, I'm sure you guys are, are doing research and development all the time on different things, but like, I could not see past <clears throat> what you're doing today. So I'm, I'm just curious to know what, what you guys are looking at. Yeah, so really, you're right. I mean, the technology is evolving. We're not just building the business, which is, you know, it's really built and, and commercialized and operational now, but we're also building the, the industry. I would say we're the leader in the industry. There's a lot of others who I would say are, for lack of a better word, participants in the industry. And there's a lot of announcements about this pilot and this project and this and that, and they're all very, small, probably, I'm guessing, unpaid uh, pilots, which are great, and they make for great PR and great uh, uh, and great YouTube videos. But we're, yeah. we're you know, fully operational and generating, re generating revenue and, and, and really running and operating, so definitely building the industry. So, you know, definitely we're at the forefront. Um, but I would say the way the industry is evolving is somewhat tied to the technology, but it's also somewhat tied to the regulatory environment. I mean, the way that we... The business started is really more rural and then migrating to remote uh, type areas or rural and remote and then suburban and there's really nobody operating urban today so mm -hmm. the technology point of view you know we could deliver from downtown toronto to downtown toronto but the regulations don't really allow for it right okay so, I mean, there's a lot of pilots and a lot of hype online about that kind of stuff but it's really not there yet so there's a migrate migration from you know less uh, less density population to greater density population. So we'll see that. And then residential down the road, we're focused on B2B. Again, there's a lot of hype about residential delivering coffee and muffins and right. sort of thing, which we're not really into and I'm not really worried yeah. about coffee and muffins right now, um, but more B2B applications. So I, really, I think really it's suburban, it's B2B. Uh, you will see longer range drones. 
You will see drones that carry even larger payloads in the Condor in the future. It's still a little ways away. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, it's evolving to, I would say, more density and larger and, and uh, longer capacity drones is really where it's going. And then okay. in our lifetime, it's still many, many, many years away, uh, moving people. And there's a few companies that are you know, working on that, uh, but I don't think the regulator is going to be allowing that anytime soon for unmanned uh, flying taxis. But that's... Yeah, we haven't even... We don't even have unmanned cars yet. Yeah, um, I know. Right? Yeah, like, <laughs> the air space is even easier to fly in because it's pretty empty. But uh, still, people are, people are working on it, but it's years away. Yeah, I don't. I don't want my taxi crashing in the air. <laughs> Jeez. So we're getting a, a couple of questions come in. Um, you know, I, I think uh, does the system have the capability of collision avoidance autonomously, or is it only when a person takes over to avoid a collision? Any AI, artificial well, intelligence. The system would alert us if uh, a collision was imminent, and typically spacing is uh, based on time or based on distance. Right. Uh, but the system would alert us that there is uh, a collision that's imminent, which is rare, obviously, mm -hmm. or that there's some other kind of emergency in the airspace, and we need to everybody needs to clear out of the way, or you know, some event like that. And then we would then manually control the drone remotely. Uh, right away to do whatever we need to do to deconflict the situation. So the system is automated to alert us, but the action taken to deconflict the situation is a human action. And I think okay. the regulators strongly prefer that versus uh, some kind of onboard system. I mean, there really, there really aren't, although they're advertised, I would say that there really aren't onboard uh, detect and avoid systems because to detect a, an aircraft far enough away mm -hmm. that is moving quickly, you need a you know some kind of a large radar system, and you're not going to put that on a drone. Yeah. And then for the drone to decide what needs to happen, uh, that's always not intuitively obvious. Uh, where human interaction, I think uh, humans are still a little smarter than computers. Yeah, I think that's why Melinda was asking if there's an artificial intelligence integration, but it doesn't doesn't seem we're, like that yet. We're, we're using real intelligence instead of artificial intelligence real yeah real intelligence instead of artificial awesome and and people learning not machine learning right so fantastic service the company will save many lives yeah i i think uh i i think with the way that climate change is headed and and just with the you know we're seeing ice roads melt earlier some some not even freezing at all uh, huge applications for something like that. And, yeah, you know. that's a good point. Some of the remote communities are seasonal waterways or seasonal roads, and they can be completely isolated. Um, and drones are a perfect application to keep the supply chain open, especially with the pandemic now wanting to limit person to person contact. So, yeah, you're right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, what other, we got a couple other questions. There was someone asking about what kind of redundant communication is used with the drone. How does it integrate with Transport Canada and Department of Defense non-radar aircraft? So we um, we can put ADSB on the aircraft if necessary. Okay. Uh, we don't always. Um, and we can detect other aircraft that have ADSB. Uh, we can also detect other aircraft that don't have ADSB as part of our uh, detect the avoid system um but uh really it's a uh it's an unmanned system uh that fully can integrate into active airspace so we've got all of the intelligence built into the the, the flight software to be able to uh, do what we need to fly in active airspace so that's that's really okay. how it works okay and and scott is a, i i kind of had this thought in my head too when you talked about drop capability yeah, how does it know if something's below it or not? So it depends where we're going. Um, it depends on the scenario. If it is, because uh, we, we typically don't have cameras on our drones and we're not flying based on a camera because there's a lot of issues with privacy and flying over your home and you know all that oh, yeah. kind of stuff. So we don't typically use visual flight rules or fly by camera. Uh, so it depends. If it's a, an application where uh, we're flying to a, a customer that's a commercial or industrial customer, which we're doing now, we're dropping cargo, it's a pre-designated area that might just be fenced off. So we know that there's no people there okay. or, or what have you. If it's a medical emergency and we're dropping a defibrillator, 
you know, it's, it's probably fairly safe that we're not going to drop the defibrillator on the person, given that we're going to our, you know, in the middle of a natural park yeah. like that. Yeah. Even if we did, it's probably better to drop the defibrillator on the person than not drop it at all. Maybe um, it'll kick, kick start them. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, typically, uh, it depends on the scenario if we've pre vetted the location or, or not. So every, every network and every customer is going to be different. The, the difference that we have versus others is we're not lowering a cargo with a little string and a cardboard box. Um, that's one means of doing it. It's not our preferred model because somebody could, you know, yank on that string and gets caught in something. It gets caught in the wind, gets caught on the rotors. We're also typically not dropping cargo via parachute because you could drop it and the wind blows it a kilometer away, which is not very helpful. We tend to lower to uh, maybe, you know, 10, 20 feet. Uh, 30 feet. So obviously we're not going to hit anybody. And then we're dropping from a very low altitude. So it's not really going to injure anybody. But in, in the case of a medical emergency or humanitarian aid, yeah, we could be dropping anywhere. But you know, okay. the probability of hitting somebody is pretty low. Yeah. And, and so you're literally, it's just detaching from the, the drone and, and falling down. There's not a little and kind of thing. Dropping, Yeah. And the kind of things we'd be dropping with the sparrow wouldn't be, you know, 500 pounds of food or something like that. It could be a defibrillator or EpiPen. It's not really going to hurt anybody. Yeah. So that's the spare there. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Okay. And, and if you're just tuning in, um, uh, this is being recorded. And so I'll be posting it back on LinkedIn and in the event page for uh, a replay session. Cause it sounds like Peter had to share the link cause something, uh, wasn't going on with the event. Right. So just to let you know, we'll, we'll be doing that. Uh, any, I don't know. I was kind of thinking like, you know, what, what is the possibility to kind of have a, you must deliver on water. Like I've seen photos with some of your drones and a, like a, it looked like an oil uh, drill rig on water or something. I don't know if that was for you, but are you, are you delivering out over the water like that? Yeah. So applications are, are pretty broad. If you look at the industrial commercial applications, oil and gas would definitely be one of them. So we could deliver from um, you know, the mainland to an oil rig at sea, and we're in discussions with a number of those oil companies. There are thousands and thousands of those oil rigs off the coast of Texas, Louisiana, Norway, West Africa, you know, east of Brazil, and, and these sort of places. So we're in those kind of discussions. But yeah, you could deliver from land to oil rig. They're typically using a very, I would say, unreliable and not very safe boat service or a very expensive and not always available uh, helicopter service. So a drone right. is perfect for that. It could also be uh, delivering within an open pit mine or in some kind of industrial uh, infrastructure area where there's construction going on, mining going on, oil and gas exploration going on, these sort of things. So any kind of land or sea-based uh, delivery can be done. And even there are some large ports around the world where uh, some of the ships would uh, stay off port for a certain period of time, a few days or weeks. And uh, again, you need to get things from shore to those very large ships, uh, like documents, medical supplies, or any kind of specialized uh, cargo. And we can do that as well. That is awesome. Uh, not not sure if you'll, if you'll know this one about some training stuff, but someone's asking about... Uh, part 135 in, in order to fly in the United States. And can you talk about what that means for you and how long does it take to get certified? Sure. So we announced um, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, I guess it was, that we're, we've started the process to uh, enter the U.S. I mean, that's uh, something that will benefit us in, in 2021. So what we're doing is we're getting the Sparrow type approved uh, in the U.S. Uh, with the FAA. Uh, we have... Okay. We have experience with the FAA. One of the flights you showed was was with the FAA in uh, in New York, I think 2017, 2018. I forget when it was a long time ago. And uh, so we've started that process. We can operate uh, in the U.S. under Part 107, which is really what a lot of the hype has been in the internet and a lot of the recent announcements. Um, but that's that's a very, I would say, you know, small scale, very controlled, short range type projects. Um, to operate in full scale, you need part 135. And we are currently in discussions with a number of American companies who would be our partners, who they would be part 135 and they would be the operator of our system. Outside of Canada, our business model is to 
license some uh, somebody else as the operator. So it could okay. be a large airline, a large courier company. There's some you know obvious names. So yeah, because you mentioned you said uh, flight is is your cloud based flight management yep. system F L Y T E. Yep. That's something you would license as part of the the package. Right. So we would, in the case outside of Canada, we would license them rights to use the system, the flight software. We would sell them the hardware. They would install the projects. And then the, the end customer would be their customer and they would pay us a licensing fee. It's kind of like a franchise without yeah. being a franchise, but something along those lines. Yeah. Okay. So we are uh, to potential partners in the US, some large, well known companies uh, that would be part 135 certified to use our okay. system. Okay. So I, I don't know if you, you this, I mean, this is not your role in the company, but I would imagine like, do you have an app on your phone that you can like check on at night to see where your drones are and how they're operating? Um, we have a big operations center with a big, yeah. green, big, big wall. But you're not at home, like on your phone, checking out where the no, drones are. No, no, no. Um, okay. I mean, no, I mean, you, you could, and, and, you know, I, I, I can definitely envision that we will have apps in the future, yeah. probably more around the sort of the national park thing that I was talking about. You know, you're canoeing and, you know, you need, uh, you know, your your child has a medical emergency. You need an EpiPen, you need an insulin pen, a snake bite kit. You can press a button on your iPhone. It knows your GPS coordinates. It calls and that sort of thing. That I can see being app based. That would be, yeah, especially now that the parks are starting to get more connected. And I think the satellite, uh, the satellite connections for internet now are starting to really increase with 5G. So yeah, yeah. that that would be awesome. A lot of cool things to come for sure. Like think about the the search and rescue applications that would have, because I mean, look at what Spot did for backcountry hikers. Now you've got an ability for backcountry hikers to just push a button and have a drone pop by um talk about that's that's pretty cool right yeah we can drop off any kind of emergency aid or uh, you know a thermal blanket or some food or you know that sort of thing to keep somebody uh you know alive until uh until proper help arrives yeah what uh i don't know like i think if i i mean you i well actually let's go i wanted to ask you about air canada what is that because you just announced something also with Air Canada. I wanted to get into that uh, quickly. Right. So a little over a year ago, I think it was the end of May, we signed a 10-year uh, a commercial agreement with Air Canada. Uh, they are our commercial partner acting as a reseller of our system in Canada and globally. And uh, the projects that we've announced recently, so the Beausoleil and Georgina Island projects that we've been talking about, they came um, as a result of our work together with um, with Air Canada to identify uh, customers and needs in the indigenous communities in Canada. Uh, so yeah, they are acting as a reseller of our of our service initially in Canada, um, but now uh, as we expand globally. Okay, that's a bit that's a huge deal. That's yeah, sure. uh, that's that's and I like to see like these like another aerospace another aircraft industry like the two of you working together to advance this this sector in canada yeah absolutely i mean they bring a lot yeah. to the table in terms of air canada cargo they they move a lot of cargo and have expertise in moving specialized cargo like dangerous goods or pharmaceuticals obviously we bring a lot to the table in terms of drones so working together you've got uh you've got great synergies and and uh a, a great force to uh to build the market yeah so any uh any advice to future uh, like students out there, you know, people that are interested in drones, like I know your background, you came from a, a more of a corporate background, you've got programming experience. And I know you worked with Staples Canada for quite some time. Uh, like, what was the transition for for you into the drone industry? Because I, I know there's probably people listening that just think that you've got a very cool job, even though I'm sure it's like, budget review and stakeholder relate and all that good stuff. You're not, you're not out flying drones every day, but uh, what was the transition like for you to get into the drone industry? So my, my technical background is I have a electrical engineering degree from University right. of Toronto. Uh, so I worked as a hardware design engineer, I worked as a software design engineer at Motorola, Alcatel and some big companies. Uh, and then I uh, went to go work for Schlumberger, which is a big oil and gas company. And I was a, 
uh, president there for for quite a while, and then um, and then I went to work uh, as president of, of Yahoo Canada, a little internet company. Oh and yeah, then, I've heard of that one. Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, Staples Business Advantage, which is the B two B side of Staples, and then so when I was at Staples Business Advantage, we actually did what I think um, is the first e-commerce delivery in North America from oh. a real company to a real customer with a real order, not just some you know pilot for a cute YouTube video or something like that, Yeah, um, but a real project. And uh, that was between Staples and Drone Delivery Canada. So when I was with Staples, I got exposure to the Drone Delivery uh, Canada company and, and uh, management team. And I, and I stayed in touch and uh, uh, and then this opportunity became available. That's that's how I transitioned into the, into the drone world. So my background is is engineering. I did my MBA after my engineering, and I did a P log, which is in logistics. So my background is engineering, business, and logistics. So it was a good fit for what we're doing, obviously. Yeah, and then I then I imagine that business to business experience with Staples and it has helped you on the CEO side of things. Uh, yeah, I mean, even, yeah. Even when I was with Yahoo, I mean, a lot of our customers were big corporations or. Uh, or Schlumberger, obviously big corporations as well in oil and gas. So yeah. my world has always been in the in the B two B world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it I I I love talking to Canadian CEOs because I I don't know if there's enough of that going on to hear about uh, the experiences and backgrounds of of Canadian CEOs. Um, so yeah, thanks thanks for that background. I, I I didn't know if we would get here, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna see if you remember the the size of the fish you caught. I, I know it was in 2007 because I did my homework. So you have a picture, you're gonna put a picture up. Oh, I'd have to, I, you know what? I didn't, uh, I know where to get it. I could actually, uh, it's okay. uh no, it's okay. <laughs> it was a big Northern Pike. So you were in a, a, a fishing tournament. So, um, I've got a few buddies in, in Winnipeg and every year i haven't done it for i think a year now i guess pandemic and all the things going on but every year for wow many 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 years we would get together in the summer and we would go to a different fishing lodge and we would uh fish for uh pike musky um you know smallmouth bass etc cetera, etc cetera. so i ended up uh, that year uh, i ended up catching the the largest fish which is a very large northern pike it was I forget how big it was and how much it weighed, but it was it was pretty big. It was it was musky size, even though it was a pike. It was it was because I remember I, in your picture, like it was well across your chest. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. it was a giant one. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so I think um, I, I promised you some transition time before before your next meeting. If if anyone's got any last comments or questions, uh, I I really want to thank you, Michael, for for doing this. Like I said earlier. Uh, I don't think we hear enough from some, some of Canada's CEOs. Uh, I think there's a lot, a lot to learn from from people like you about your experiences, especially coming up from the tech industry in in the early '80s until now, and and seeing how things have advanced, uh, especially in Canada in the aerospace industry. Everyone knows the Avro Aero story mm-hmm. and the disappointment with that, but I think. You know, companies like Drone Delivery Canada are putting Canada back on the map. Um, so, you know, I, I I think this is a great story for our country. Uh, I think it's a great resource for emergency and disaster managers who live in remote, isolated, rural communities to start thinking about how they want to incorporate this type of service in into their into their plans. Uh, and I, I really appreciate you taking some time out of your busy day to to swing by and have this conversation with us. My pleasure. Yeah. I mean, it's a great Canadian success story Yeah, and, and uh, the intellectual property and the patents of all ours. So we're very happy to be a uh, very Canadian, of course, and, uh, and uh, appreciate uh, you having me on and, and having an opportunity to share the story. Uh, people can go to drone delivery and there's information about all the applications and, and, and videos and, and that sort of thing. So. Yeah, I was going to ask you where where we can find you. So we've got dronedeliverycanada.com. I know you're on, you've got accounts on LinkedIn uh, and Twitter. And, yeah, so anybody yeah. can go to, there's a there's Drone Delivery Canada the website, dronedeliverycanada.com. If you search for Drone Delivery Canada on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, on Everywhere. YouTube, there's a lot of good videos. If you actually want to see 
the system and see it flying, uh, you can go to YouTube as well. Yeah, I, I liked how uh, how a couple of times there you made mention of the the little YouTube videos of the other drone pilot, like the the residential. I thought that's kind of funny because yeah, there's a lot of videos out there showing drones and and what they're doing, but what Drone Delivery Canada involved in, is involved in like this is high tech, very customized. Uh, and significant infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to bash my competitors, but uh, and, and I'm not naive or arrogant to think that we won't have competitors one day. But there's a lot of smoke and mirrors and a lot of hype in any kind of yeah. new industry like ours. And you got to peel away the onion and really see, you know, is this is this a real project uh, or is this stuff some controlled, uh, you know, video production that's not really a real project? So. You know, do your due diligence when you're looking at who you want to work with or if you want to invest in the industry, just make sure you do your due diligence and look for a, a company that's actually operating commercially. Yeah, 100 percent. So. All right. Well, I want to thank uh, Michael again for joining us. I want to thank everybody out there for for tuning in again. I will ha I've recorded this session. We will get it up on YouTube and propagate it through Facebook and LinkedIn. And uh, uh, again, Michael, thanks for your time. And for everybody out there, disaster emergency managers, stay connected and take care. Thank you.